Welcome. Uh, I'm Jim Fishkin, Chair of the Department of Communication here at Stanford, and I'd like to thank the Law School and the Program in American Studies for co-sponsoring this, which is, I believe, the 43rd uh, year of the uh, McClatchy Lectures. And I'm very proud to welcome Floyd Abrams here to Stanford as a McClatchy Fellow, uh, since the McClatchy Endowment is supposed to have a focus on First Amendment issues. The list of McClatchy Fellows over the last 40-some years is, is in fact very distinguished. It includes Walter Cronkite, R.W. Apple, Tom Wicker, Glenn Eiffel, Bill Moyers, many others. These journalists and public intellectuals all benefited from the freedom of the press and freedom of expression, which Floyd Abrams, as much as anyone over the same 40 years, has helped to define and to defend. Floyd Abrams has been involved in every major case raising issues of press freedom over these 40 years. His name is so intertwined with the First Amendment that it seems only appropriate that Floyd Abrams and the First Amendment share the same initials. Uh, these, the cases range from the Pentagon Papers to his successful argument before the Supreme Court in Landmark Communications versus Virginia, establishing that the government can never constitutionally punish the publication of truthful information about public officials. He's defended all kinds of clients, including the Brooklyn Museum of Art from Mayor Rudy Giuliani over a famously controversial art exhibit, NBC from Wayne Newton, and Al Franken even from a trademark lawsuit brought by Fox News over the use of the phrase fair and balanced in the title of his book. Now my intro would just be far too long if I tried to begin enumerating these cases and I've only just mentioned the relatively early stuff. It's very interesting, he writes how as an undergraduate at Cornell, he wrote a senior thesis arguing that press freedoms should be abridged to protect the right to a fair trial. And he marvels that 20 years later, he believed the opposite and defended that position before the Supreme Court. And I think it's a dramatic illustration of how freedom of expression protects us all in the right to change our mind. And we learn the most, as John Stuart Mill famously said, by considering the arguments of those we disagree with. Uh, and if those were not expressed, our own true opinions would become what Mill called dead dogmas encumbering the ground. We only have a lively impression of their meaning by discussing with those we disagree with. Now perhaps the most dramatic case is the one that appears first in, his, in the title of his talk for today, The Pentagon Papers. And as I reread his account of that, uh, his account of meeting Alexander Bickel, uh, who was then visiting at this Yale Law School, uh, meeting Alexander Bickel at 2.30 in the morning to work all night to confront Richard Nixon's Justice Department and its attempts to intimidate and silence the press. I could only think of, the image that came into my mind was all the president's men in Watergate, also with those midnight meetings or 2 a.m. meetings. But then I realized that there would have been no Watergate burglar, there would have been no Watergate if it were not for the Pentagon Papers. The plumbers who did the Watergate burglary were hired by Nixon to stop any further leaks like the ones Floyd Abrams protected. Then when I realized that Floyd's unexpected rise to celebrity by age 35 was all predicted by an Indian fortune teller whom he was taken to in exchange for a going to a, for a baseball game, I decided this is just too good a story. It's a story for Hollywood. Floyd deserves his own movie. Um, that movie has not been yet made yet, but I want to close by saying you can buy the book today with advanced copies, and these are, these are the first available copies. You know, people collect first editions. These are the first sales, and it's called Friend of the Court, and he will, I think, sign copies after his talk, and I do hope he's retained the movie rights. So I'm pleased to present Floyd Abrams, who's done more 
than anybody else to facilitate and renegotiate our understanding of the First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank all of you for uh, coming. I have to start with an Al Franken story. Uh, the case, as Jim mentioned, was an absolutely absurd one. Uh, a book had been published, uh, uh, written by Franken, criticizing Fox News. Uh, and there were pictures of Bill O'Reilly and two other uh, on-air people uh, from uh, Fox. Uh, and the uh, title of it uh, had the words fair and balanced in the title. Fox News sued saying people would think this was their book, that they had written it, this book denouncing Fox and denouncing O'Reilly, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a hearing in front of a judge, and we won. And I was feeling really good. I hadn't met Al Franken, uh, that the client was the book publisher. I'd never met Franken. I thought, well, I'll call Franken up and tell him. We won. You know, I pick up the phone, called him. I said, I just want you to know the judge ruled in our favor. And he said, even a chimp could have won that case. <laughs> so, so I just want you to know that, that e even when things are going good, not everybody fully appreciates you. Uh, my <laughs> new book starts out with an old story. Uh, uh, it starts out with a story when I was an undergraduate uh, at Cornell. Uh, I take a breath and say, uh, in the far off uh, 1950s, we went on a debating trip, the debating team that I then headed uh, to M uh, McGill uh, University in Montreal. And when it was over, uh, there was a dinner uh, and, and the, the the Canadian uh, debaters sat at one dinner table and we were at another, and I was told that I should raise a toast to our Canadian friends. And, uh, so I raised a glass of wine and I said to the Queen, which everybody had told me was appropriate. Everybody nodded. And uh, the Canadian equivalent of me on their team thought for a second, and he said, to the American Constitution, he said, with all its amendments, and, uh, he was thinking of the fifth, I think, for various reasons, uh, and that, but, but what he said was, especially the first. Now that was in the 1950s, which were sort of bad years for the First Amendment, bad years for the Bill of Rights. Senator McCarthy was not a historical figure. He was around then uh, uh, doing his uh, thing. Uh, the courts were not really very open to First Amendment arguments, even some of our greatest judges uh, did not seem to be present in terms of defending uh, First Amendment rights, even learned hand, great, great jurist that he was, who had written superb First Amendment uh, pieces as far back as the 1920s. Uh, in the 1950s was writing some of his less, uh, I would say, uh, persuasive and certainly less protective uh, uh, works. And, and in the interim, from the 50s on, what one saw was a lot of historical, at least in, in retrospect, and never at the time, uh, in the context of a variety of things happening out there in the world, the First Amendment exploded. In the, the degree to which it was protective, in the availability of it, uh, in the breadth provided uh, uh, to uh, protect uh, people under the First Amendment uh, because of the Civil Rights Revolution. Uh, and in that context, the uh, New York Times against Sullivan was decided, essentially federalizing libel law, which had never, never, when I went to law school, there was no protection under the First Amendment for libel. Libel was taught like admiralty law 
as a separate body of law governed by its own standards. Uh, you, you learned the words or you didn't, or you learned the concepts or you didn't, but there was no First Amendment protection. And here came the Supreme Court in 1964, not just saying there was protection, but saying that when you said something critical of a public official, later uh, public figures as well, when you did that, uh, even if it was false, you were legally protected so long as you weren't lying, so long as you didn't know it was false or have serious doubts about the truth or falsity of it. And then with, with more and more activism on campuses and, and more and more dissent from the war in Vietnam, uh, you had a series of events which led to the great case in 1968 of Brandenburg versus Ohio in which the Supreme Court said uh, even when you say things which seem to be violence oriented, violence approving, that you could not be held liable for those words, for saying those things, unless it was meant to cause violence and had a high likelihood uh, of doing that. And then in the 1970s, in the middle of the war in Vietnam, of course, came the Pentagon Papers case uh, that, that I was involved in, protecting the press uh, against the government going to court, trying to get a prior restraint against material viewed and stamped with the words top secret by the Defense Department, a historical study uh, prepared during the war about how we got into the war. And one can say that all of those uh, cases, and I could cite a lot more, were cases initially of their time, and then eventually cases that remain, uh, I don't want to say for all time, but, but which have lasted through our generation and hopefully far uh, into the future. And in those times, for the most part, speaking generally now, the First Amendment was a liberal amendment. Liberals, progressives, and the like were the ones winning those cases. And that was entirely consistent with the, the history of the First Amendment. Uh, Professor Balkin, that Yale Law School had written that, that the First Amendment has normally been the friend of left-wing values, whether it was French emigres and Republicans in the 1790s, abolitionists in the 1840s, <coughs> pacifists in the 1910s, organized labor in the 1920s and 1930s, civil rights protesters in the 1950s and 60s. There were conservatives who voted in favor of the First Amendment on those cases, and certainly one of the great cases written by a conservative was Cohn versus California, also a late 1960s case about a young man who walked into a movie theater in Los Angeles wearing a T-shirt that said, fuck the draft. And he was found to have violated uh, the uh, law by wearing it. It went to the Supreme Court. Uh, and Justice Harlan, a true conservative, wrote the opinion for the court saying that that was protected uh, speech, uh, even in a courthouse. What I want to offer to you now is a, a, a thesis, a theory, about something that's happened in more recent years. Uh, the, the sort of coarse way, intellectually at least, to say it is that the conservatives have discovered the First Amendment. That conservative intellectuals, conservative intellectuals about ju juridical matters have discovered the First Amendment. And that the ultimate impact of that is that we have decisions of the Supreme Court now <clears throat> which would have been unthinkable, not just in the 1950s, but, but maybe even in the 1970s, and surely in the 1980s and 90s, uh, to cite two of them. The Supreme Court has held, and you, you remember reading about this, that, that uh, this family, the Phelps family, uh, that calls themselves a church, uh, the Westboro Baptist Church, which demonstrates 
wherever the police let them stand, as close to churches as possible and funerals as possible, denouncing American servicemen who died uh, in Afghanistan and before that in Iraq, <clears throat> and denouncing them essentially in anti-gay language, basically saying, you, with, with the name of the, uh, of the deceased soldier, you deserve to die because America is soft on what they call fags, big signs, posters, just awful. The father of, one of, an, of a deceased Marine sued, won a judgment uh, in a court uh, in Baltimore for intentional infliction of emotional injury, goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, by an eight to one vote, said that that judgment was inconsistent with the First Amendment. Why? Because the commentary that the people were engaged in was political commentary. However offensive it was, it was about a socio-political subject, the treatment of gays in or by America. Eight to one. I cannot tell you with what assuredness I speak when I say that decision by that vote, with every conservative member of the vote uh, of, of, the, of the court, except for Justice Alito, joining the majority opinion, really would have been unthinkable not many years before. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, the Supreme Court had another case also in 2011 with uh, another of these horrible fact situations, uh, this one involving uh, films taken of uh, uh, small animals being tortured. Now every state and the federal government makes it a crime to torture animals. The question is, if someone filmed it, could that be a crime? And the Supreme Court said no, it could not. The statute was too broadly drafted uh, and it could not withstand First Amendment uh, scrutiny. Eight to one vote. Eight to one vote, absolutely unthinkable, not that many years before. My view is that the reason that came about, the way it came about, is that because of certain new issues in American political, social life, conservatives, conservatives, uh, again, I've called intellectual conservatives, but the right wing started to say, we, we are entitled to First Amendment protection for some of the things we want to do or to be able to do without legal sanctions. One of those uh, arose in a case called Hill versus Colorado, a case I think is one of the worst First Amendment cases of the last century. <coughs> it arose in the context of Colorado passing a law designed to protect women uh, who wanted to have abortions in situations in which they were sometimes being yelled at, cursed, approached, blocked, uh, and the like from walking in to an abortion clinic. But instead of passing a law dealing with blocking or some other equivalent which prevented them from going into the clinic, Colorado passed a broader law, basically saying within 100 feet of any medical facility, one could not approach a person going into the facility closer than eight feet without that person's consent for the purpose of informing, educating, advocating, or the like, anything to that person. It's a very broad statute. It's a statute, in my view, that uh, should not have withstood First Amendment scrutiny. It did. The liberals, I'm 
oversimplifying, you lawyers and law students will know with language like that, but it has some meaning still. Uh, the more liberal members of the court <coughs> said that this was a reasonable piece of legislation, that uh, uh, this was, uh, Justice Stevens wrote the opinion, as, as he has written many opinions, that First Amendment types have some problems with. Uh, Justice Stevens said that this was consistent with the general policy of uh, protecting unwilling listeners and avoiding unwarranted communication and recognizing the privacy interest in avoiding unwarranted communication. Justice uh, Scalia uh, wrote a dis dissenting opinion uh, joined by two members uh, of the court, which was uh, incendiary. Uh, now this was in part, as Justice Scalia made very clear, that in his view, this was a speech restriction directed against opponents of abortion. Uh, and it was part of what he called the ad hoc nullification machine of the more liberal or less conservative members of the court. I put all that aside. What Justice Scalia did in his opinion was to cite all the great liberal heroes of the past. Justice Douglas and Justice Black and, and the liberal heroes when I was in law school, in fact, uh, with what they were saying then uh, about the First Amendment um, and uh, 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 answering Justice uh, Stevens. Justice Stevens had said, I quote, the statute poses no special threat to First Amendment freedoms because it applies alike to used car salesmen animal rights activists, fundraisers, environmentalists, and missionaries. Scalia's answer was, this is a wonderful replication, except for its lack of sarcasm, of Anatole France's observation that the law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges. Uh, and the Colorado law, Scalia said, was no more targeted at used car sales and animal rights activists and the like than French vagrancy law was targeted uh, at the rich. And right there, Justice Scalia started quoting Justice Douglas. And when Justice Stevens had said, well, you remember Justice Brandeis talked about the right to be let alone, the great, in the great article, the, the most quoted legal article ever written in a law review was Justice Brandeis was one of the two authors of when he was a practicer of law and he talked about the right to be let alone. And Justice Scalia said the First Amendment protects the right to be let alone from the government, not from individuals. The First Amendment protects the right to speak to try to persuade someone not to have an abortion. Now, I think Justice Scalia was right. Uh, that certainly is the First Amendment side of that case, but more important, it seems to me one of the first cases in which the conservatives then, then in a dissent found themselves, I don't want to say reading because they knew the cases were there, but adopting, assimilating, uh, and, and using the First Amendment rhetoric, the First Amendment uh, fervor uh, of uh, past decisions. There's another case that you might have heard of, uh, citizens something or other. Uh, 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 I saved that for about 15 minutes uh, into my talk because I thought you might agree until now with what I'm about to say. So, what shall one say about that case? I start with what I was saying earlier, which was whether you like that opinion or not, the majority, now the conservative, filled it in Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court with quotations and language and themes from the liberal jurists of, of the past. Uh, in this situation where the issue was the constitutionality 
of uh, statutes which effectively banned uh, corporations and unions uh, from spending money supporting candidates for a federal public office. Uh, it, it fell to Justice Kennedy, the one saying that the law was unconstitutional, to quote from a dissenting opinion from probably the four most liberal members of the Supreme Court ever to sit on the court at the same time, Justices Rutledge, Murphy, Black, and Douglas, in a case under a similar statute, but brought against a union in 1948, United States versus CIO, where uh, they, dissenting, said, whatever undue influence is obtained by making large expenditures is outweighed by, uh, by the loss for the democratic processes resulting from restrictions on free and public debate. And it was Justice Kennedy writing for the right wing on the court who quoted from a dissenting opinion of Justice Douglas's Black and Chief Justice Warren two years later saying, some may think that one group or another should not express its views in an election because it is too powerful. But this is not justification for withholding First Amendment rights from any group, labor or corporate. First Amendment rights are part of the heritage of all persons and groups in this country. That is an introduction to something that I thought I would show you. I am supremely untalented in new modes of communication. And the fact that I think that they're new says something about me. But I do know about putting something into a machine and watching it on a screen. So if you could put the lights off. This is the first five minutes of what was at issue in Citizens United. This is the first five minutes of Hillary, the movie made, the movie made by a conservative group, which was partially a conservative corporation, but a conservative group, which is partially funded by corporate uh, uh, contributions. Uh, the statute at issue in the Citizens United case, on its face, made it a crime for a corporation to spend money supporting or opposing a candidate for federal office within 60 days of an election uh, or 30 days of a primary or 30 days of a convention. And this conservative group went to court saying, we want to show, the, I'm sorry, and, and, and doing it on television or on cable or on satellite. So th this group went to court saying, we want the right to show this movie on pay, pay per view. And the lower court said no. And the Supreme Court, in this extremely controversial opinion, said uh, this was constitutionally protected. And here's how the movie began. She's driven by the power. She's driven to get the power. That is the driving force in her life. She does not answer questions uh, straight out. She is the expert of not 
saying what she believes. She will run on attacking Republicans and and being the first woman president. And oh, isn't that amazing? Ooh, it's a woman. She can walk and talk. The thought here is it's all politics. Parcel out favors to individual groups, whether it's unions here or the farm block there. But she is steeped in controversy, steeped in sleaze. That's why they don't want us to look at her record. I would recommend that Hillary Clinton appreciate that she's not going to be, by any means, the candidate of American women. American women have diverse views on politics, just like men. At the core of almost every one of the investigations we did for eight years, uh, where there were problems, and I mean major problems, with the Clinton administration, she was at the core of them. It's part of the Clinton method, which is say what you need to say at, at any given moment and rely on the lack of memory of the American public and the support of the mainstream media to support that lack of memory. Well, the 20-year plan really is that the Clintons share power. Now, one would be president eight years, and one would be president another eight years over a span of 20 years with a little uh, Republican in between, perhaps. So in essence, what happened is that Bill and Hillary, in their mid-20s, before they ever took their marital vows, they took their political vows. You know, a lot of people ask me, do we have to go through all these old Clinton scandals again? Well, I have good news for you. You don't, because you can look at the new ones, because Hillary Clinton scandals are a gift that keeps on giving. Ruthless vindictive, mendacious, venal, sneaky, ideological, intolerant, liar is a good one, scares the hell out of me, looks good in a pantsuit. That was the first three minutes uh, of the movie. Uh, you'll be amused to hear that it was the position of the people who made the movie, Citizens United, that this was not advocacy against electing Hillary Clinton president. They lost that for every judge uh, <coughs> that they appeared before. Uh, as I said, the statute involved banned that on its face and in effect the day-to-day -day ads over that appeared over and over again in various uh, states around the country if the money that paid for them came from a corporation if this was shown within 60 days of an election or 30 of a convention and if it was shown on television or cable uh, or satellite. Uh, to say first that this was an issue which enormously animated the, the more conservative members of the court and had done so for years uh, until they had a fifth vote, uh, which they used uh, to strike this a statue down. Uh, one member of the court years before had said to me that he thought it was this, that, that earlier decisions to the contrary, and there have been decisions both ways in this area, uh, was the single worst decision since that member of the court had been on the court. Uh, it's very controversial. Uh, uh, and it is probably the most attacked and uh, publicly despised opinion, surely since Bush versus Gore, and maybe even uh, transcending that. Uh, by my lights, it's a terrific First Amendment opinion. Uh, but then by my lights, when I happened to be in Ohio a week before the last national election, and I turned on television, and all there were were political ads, which of course were driving the people of Ohio mad, 
but political ads again and again and again, I said to a friend of mine, this is the First Amendment paradise. Here we have, you know, what are they talking about? Talking about who to vote for? Uh, so, uh, I'm not gonna go into the totality or by any means of the arguments uh, ab about this case. Uh, for me, and a still pretty small group of, of people, uh, uh, it is a very powerful First Amendment opinion of Justice Kennedy. I urge you to read, particularly any law students here, the opinion of Justice Kennedy and the dissenting opinion uh, of Justice Stevens um, and, uh, and see what you think. But apropos my broader point that, that I started this talk with, this is surely the most recent example of uh, uh, conservatives sort of latching on to, buying into, and citing as their own, as they have every right to, of uh, some of the great, great liberal opinions of the past, liberal language of the past, or, or to say it in a way that I like it better, First Amendment language uh, of, of more liberal jurists uh, in, in the past. One of the main themes of my book, which is really a collection of of debates I've been in, including one against Bert Newborn, who's here today. Uh, uh, essays, uh, written book reviews, uh, uh, legal arguments, uh, uh, articles, and the like, uh, with an, uh, uh, what I hope is a serious introduction to it. But one of the main themes, I would say, is how important it is to divorce one's view of the First Amendment from one's view of what is uh, uh, politically or socially uh, good policy. Uh, because they're not always the same and they shouldn't be always the same. Back in 1990, The Nation uh, magazine put together a panel of people who had written something or other about the First Amendment in the past, and basically said that, I quote, liberals and, and progressives uh, should consider rethinking their position on uh, the First Amendment. Uh, and the reason was that it was being used, quote, to thwart progressive reforms uh, such as caps on public spending, uh, public uh, uh, access uh, in, in certain situations, and uh, uh, cigarette advertisements. Um, my response to them then, and my response now, is that instead of rethinking their First Amendment positions, to comport with their political and social positions, that they should do the opposite, that they should rethink their political positions to avoid being on the wrong side of the First Amendment. Now, one doesn't have to agree, as I don't, with the, the what I'll call the conservative members of the court in their political orientation, Justice uh, Scalia is the easiest uh, example in what he writes in every case involving abortion, homosexual issues, and the like. Um, but it seems to me really important um, to try to divorce, as sometimes he cannot, uh, one's ideological views one's political views, one's social views, even as to very important issues, to divorce them from the question of what may be said and what may not be said, the question of how to read the First Amendment, the question of what is protected and what is not protected uh, under the Bill of Rights. Uh, and another piece I wrote in The Nation a few years later I said that the oldest reality about the First Amendment 
is this, hardly anyone really believes that we should protect the free speech of those with whom we disagree. That proposition that we do protect it is of course at the heart uh, of the First Amendment. And it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. In probably the greatest First Amendment opinion of all time, uh, the great dissenting opinion of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, he made the point that it was perfectly logical to try to quiet people who are saying things that you think are wrong and that you think will do harm to the country. But, he said, we have to accept the notion that we may be wrong in what we think uh, and to accept the, 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 the overview that uh, we protect uh, a marketplace of ideas, uh, as, he, as he put it. Uh, I wind up my book uh, on the last page with a sort of a plea in which I say that one of the oldest of all political observations is that where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, is it really too much to ask, I say, that those who claim that they care about the First Amendment, everybody that is, stand in favor of free speech even when the speech pains them ideologically? Uh, that, to me, more than anything else and any of the disagreements on the socio-political side in this area, in this speech area, uh, is, is the central issue. It just may not be possible. Conservatives may want to protect conservative speech situations, protesting around abortion clinics. Liberals may want to protect, again, censorship of uh, sexual depictions uh, in, in books uh, or the like. Uh, but I think we're, we're coming to a point now, far better than before, in which there is a growing consensus uh, on the court that we have to protect both. There are conservative members of the court who simply do not accept that, in my other example, uh, that, that material about uh, sex is almost ever protected by the First Amendment. Um, and there are more liberal members of the court who, given their views of the nature of democracy, their serious views which deserve respect about the nature of democracy, cannot accept the notion that speech that they think results in an ultimately a less democratic result should nonetheless be protected. Uh, there's lots of speech out there which everyone would agree is protected by the First Amendment that I think does harm in one way or another. Speech that no one would think of suppressing. Does Donald Trump serve us by what he offers uh, by way of analysis or do I think Rush Limbaugh uh, protects us? But when Democratic members of Congress started talking about passing legislation, the effect of which and the intent of which would be to cut back on the amount of conservative voices on the radio, where it's overwhelmingly conservative, uh, I think uh, the rest of us have to oppose that that the rest of us have to say, well, we don't want the government acting for that purpose, and we don't want the government acting in that way. That, in any event, uh, uh, is, uh, is my view. Uh, uh, just in case any of you want to buy the book, I want you to know the book isn't filled with that. There's lots that you'll like uh, uh, in the book. And I thank you all very much. Uh, I, I'm delighted to take questions. and. Uh, 
even some uh, comments as long as you agree with me. Uh, uh, uh. We have some microphones here, if anybody wants to. Yes, please. Oh, uh, I mean, corporations have been protected. Look, look, on every case most of you would agree with me on, I've been protecting a corporation. New York Times is a corporation. Public broadcasting system is a corporation. The Brooklyn Museum is owned by a corporation. The, the notion that because we're talking about a corporation here, they, they ought not to have any First Amendment rights just seems to me totally unacceptable. Now one can say, as Justice Stevens did, I, I agree, Justice Stevens said, corporations receive First Amendment protection and have received it in the past, but the competing interest here of avoiding too much money being spent by too few people with too bad an impact on, on uh, democ democratic self-governance is something else, but, but not the notion that, that corporations should be without uh, First Amendment rights or that this case, Citizens United, stemmed from that. Yeah. Um, my question is about exactly the corporations. It seemed like nobody was arguing that, thank you very much, nobody was arguing that the content of the speech uh, which you showed part of was was something that should be regulated. Um, it was the means by which it was produced. In other words, the corporation's involvement in the political process by spending money that that by this decision changed those rules and allowed them to do that that has got so many people upset. And I'm in the examples you used about the New York Times being a corporation, those were still cases about the content. So the decisions came down and said, you can't tell the New York Times not to publish this or punish them because of what they've published. It wasn't because they were a corporation, it's because of the content of the, of the of, you know, you can't have content regulations. So it seems to me that you've talked about some limits to free speech with Wikipedia, for instance, because of the harm that it would do to this to country to the country. In the same case, there is harm done by the citizens' case, not about the content of the speech, but by the participation in the political process. I just wondered if you could talk about sure. that. Well, first, uh, in my view, Citizen United is about content. It only applies with respect to the sort of thing which is generally most protected by the First Amendment advocacy of who to vote for and who to vote against. Corporations are perfectly free to have ads advertising, perfectly free to uh, advertising their product, perfectly free to, to talk about other things, just not about this, this most important part of our uh, political system. Uh, now, be, uh, beyond that, it, it still seems to me so that saying that corporations as a group can't make this movie and put it on television is a, is a deep thrust uh, uh, into the First Amendment. Uh, uh, and, and the fact that it's a corporation, or we all agree, it, it, it applies to unions, unions as well, uh, that, that they can't do that, or they couldn't do that, um, uh, seems to me really, uh, by, by my lights, but it, put it this way, uh, you, you can d dismiss what I'm saying by what I'm about to say. I find this a much easier First Amendment case than those two recent cases I talked to you about earlier. 
with, with the demonstrations outside the uh, churches and funeral homes, or the depiction of animals being tortured, uh, I mean, the first being so outrageous that, that uh, to put it in personal terms, I was glad no one asked me to write an amicus brief uh, uh, supporting the right of the, quote, church, unquote, there uh, to do those things and say those things. Um, once you start uh, saying corporations or perhaps for profit corporations, there are people, very serious people, uh, some in this room, who would agree with me that this movie ought to be protected, whoever makes it, but want to limit that to not-for-profits. But that, that doesn't solve anything for me. I mean, that, that means Time Warner. Maybe they can do it, maybe because they're a media company. Uh, under the statute, I should have said to you, there was a media exemption. Uh, so therefore, it didn't apply to the media so Time Warner could have put this on, but a, a typical corporation could not have paid for it to be done uh, and, and then put it on. I don't think those distinctions will or should hold. Yeah, yes, please. Hi, thank you. Um, some of your comments seem to suggest that we should not inject, we or the justices or anyone, should not inject our own ideological view into our interpretation of the First Amendment. But you at one point referenced the idea of the marketplace of ideas, which itself has an ideological valence. And I wonder if you rely on that particular ideological underpinning or rationale for the First Amendment because of originalist reasons, such that you don't think it should be changed, or if there is room to provide a different rationale for how and why we interpret the First Amendment as we do? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a really good question. And, and first, I really don't talk about the marketplace of ideas very often because I agree with some of the critics who say that you know we often don't have a great marketplace. Uh, of ideas. I was just putting that in to finish the quotation from Justice Holmes. Um, I, I have a somewhat different view of the First Amendment than a lot of uh, scholars who focus on what I view as uh, some of its uh, beneficial effects, um, uh, self-fulfillment of speakers, uh, uh, and, and a wide range of others that, that have been outlined through the years. I think the First Amendment at its core is a protection against government. That's what it's about. It's designed, it's not just that it doesn't apply to individuals, it doesn't, it applies only to the government, but that it exists uh, historically and otherwise at its core as a protection against government, that it is a reaction to and a continuing reaction, in my view at least, to what we see abroad in terms of the deprivation of free speech in the name of one or another values that totalitarian or other authoritarian governments impose on their people. So I don't rely really, uh, when I think about the First Amendment, on, on sort of all the good things it does or on the the marketplace, really. Uh, uh, you know, my, my view is that that it is correct. It's a good idea that the First Amendment is so deeply rooted in the notion that when it comes to speech, and with some exceptions, but that when it comes to speech, uh, the government simply cannot be trusted, uh, and that uh, that's what you know Jefferson meant when he said he wouldn't support the Constitution unless there was a Bill of Rights, uh, which he said was something every government should have to accept. So that's my view on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not a history student or a law student, so I apologize if I mischaracterize anything here, but it's my understanding that when the First Amendment was penned, there was there were, at the very least, very few corporations with the degree of power, whether that be monetary or otherwise, to shape 
the political and social discourse of society in the way that most of the Fortune 500 companies now have due to the proliferation of new information technologies that they can easily influence and so on. So if the intent of the First Amendment was to prevent any centralized authority or authorities from monopolizing public discourse, then is there any reason why that broader mission shouldn't be construed to apply to private corporations of today as well as governments? No, if I thought the First Amendment was designed to protect against any centralized authority, I would agree with you. I don't think it is. I think it's designed to protect against government and not other centralized authorities. Now, I don't mean by that that there's nothing we can do about other centralized authorities or that there aren't other steps that can be taken or at least theoretically taken. We have political problems in terms of getting anything done, but, sorry. This is my, uh, my granddaughter calling, excuse me. Um, um, I, and I also do want to make a related point, uh, which is a practical one. I mean, I would have said everything I said, regardless of how much money was going into the system. But it just isn't so that large amounts of corporate money are really going into the, the political system uh, uh, in, in the sense that that one might think uh, from reading a lot of the, the commentary. I mean, it wasn't so uh, in the uh, 2010 election or in the 2012 election, where the big bucks are coming from are individuals, like Mr. Adelson in Nevada, uh, and, and uh, the uh, Koch, bro Koch brothers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or single person corporations that are effectively the person in corporate uh, form. But, but the, the visage of, of you know, uh, Amazon or, or of uh, Exxon, of the big oil companies spending vast sums of money, they just don't do it. Uh, uh, in part because Citizens United says that it is constitutional to require disclosure of who is spending this money, and at least under this statute, we do have the data on the money that's being spent. Where we don't have the information is on these so-called 501c3s, these companies, these, these entities that are supposedly social welfare organizations, like the Chamber of Commerce, for example, that are not required to reveal which corporations give them the money they spend, and they're allowed to spend up, up to half of, of what, what they have uh, on uh, po political uh, matters. Th that would be wholly constitutional. Uh, Citizens United holds that it would be constitutional. Congress doesn't do it, Congress doesn't do it. Uh, but that's not the fault, at least of anything that I'm talking about or anything that the Supreme Court has done. One can make an argument that the, that the political circumstances under which we live are such that Congress, although Congress may do something, it's not going to do it, either because Congress can't do anything or because there are enough votes to keep Congress from doing anything in this area. That's not the law speaking. I mean, that's, that's a part of a much broader social problem uh, that, uh, that, that we live with. And I find, I'll find a point on that. There are things we can do as a country, if we choose to, of a more egalitarian nature uh, in terms of curbing power, if one wants to do it, of large corporations. I mean, you can have a lot tougher antitrust laws, a lot tougher securities laws, a lot higher taxes, I don't think any of this is realistic uh, uh, currently because th there isn't the will to do it and, and there's not enough public support to do it. But, but it is not as if we have to curtail speech uh, in, in order to deal with what one may view as excessive corporate power. Yes. Thanks. <coughs> well, now there's also the issue of protecting us from the government in the sense of keeping far too much secret. Uh, and in, in this, I want to bring up two things. One, uh, WikiLeaks slash Bradley Manning. I know Daniel Ellsberg 
of the Pentagon Papers has argued that there's a parallel uh, between what Bradley Manning and Julian Assange are doing and, and what he did and has up, upheld this as an action that I think the introduction was that any truthful statement about government should not be outlawed and certainly WikiLeaks is, they're the documents. Uh, so I wanted your comment on that and the other is that um, uh, this National Defense Authorization Act, which is not, you may say, well, it's not directly an attack on uh, the First Amendment, but if people can be swept into a very broad, undefined category associated with terrorism or 9-11 for the political opinions, the constitutionally protected political opinions that they are expressing, this is certainly, I think, I believe, contrary to what, what you're uh, arguing for and very chilling. And of course, I've been giving people this, this uh, statement on that. Let me try to address uh, particularly the, the first. I mean, I broadly agree with you on, on the second. WikiLeaks for me is a much harder subject. Uh, I, I don't agree with, uh, with Dan Ellsberg about WikiLeaks. I do think WikiLeaks is protected by the First Amendment. So let me say that at the start. That said, I think WikiLeaks has behaved in a number of situations in a deeply reckless uh, and, and sometimes dangerous fashion. So I am not a fan of WikiLeaks. I think one of the great decisions Daniel Ellsberg made when he decided to go public and to risk his freedom by doing it and to reveal the Pentagon Papers is not to turn over four volumes, the so-called negotiating volumes, to the New York Times. These were volumes which Mr. Ellsberg feared could interfere with the negotiations to end the war in Vietnam. He did not give them to the Times, and they were therefore not published until years later. I think that was a very winning, attractive, responsible thing for him to do. WikiLeaks, in my view, has behaved uh, in a different fashion. Uh, to just cite one or two examples, uh, when WikiLeaks received over 90,000 internal military reports from American soldiers in Afghanistan, uh, it withheld a few thousand of them, but released 79,000 in their entirety. It released the entirety of the State Department documents that had been turned over to them by, let us, we have, I think we know now, by, by Bradley Manning. Uh, the State Department documents included ones revealing the names of confidential sources of human rights workers and the like. The military, and, and because of that, uh, the New York Times, uh, El Pais, uh, uh, Le Monde, The Guardian, all condemned WikiLeaks for its irresponsibility uh, in doing that. Um, and with respect to the military reports, when Mr. Uh, Assange was asked whether he or any of his people had read the, the 79,000 cables, uh, military ones, uh, reports. He said, well, we've read about 2,000 of them. But, he said, I don't think there's any reason to fear harm to national security as a result. My view on that is, number one, we're not talking about a journalist here. We're talking about a political activist who has First Amendment rights, uh, 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 Mr. Assange, uh, and in my view, no less First Amendment rights than, than journalists do. But I think it is the height of irresponsibility to turn over troves of internal documents just because he has them and just because somebody turned them over to him. Uh, so that's my view. I, I don't think Bradley Manning is a hero. I think he ought to go to jail. He will go to jail. I wrote an op-ed piece for the Times recently saying that I wished that, I hope the government would drop the charges against him 
which are based on the notion that because he gave it to WikiLeaks, he therefore knew it could reach Al-Qaeda. Uh, that, that charge, which is essentially aiding the enemy, is one which can have the death penalty. Uh, the government's not asking for it but, it, but it also has life imprisonment. He's pled guilty to violating the law by releasing classified documents. He could go to jail for many years as a result. In my view, he is not a hero for re releasing millions of classified documents, most of which he knows nothing about. Uh, uh, so I have mixed views, as you hear, about WikiLeaks. But as a general proposition, yeah, I think they're as protected uh, as, as any other uh, speaker. Uh, now, I do think as a strategic matter, which is another subject, that we wind up with more rights when the courts have reason to at least trust people who are the recipients of classified information to try to take account of national security interests. Uh, that is what the American press does. The government may not agree with how they make that decision, but they make it as Americans trying to take account of national security interests. I have no reason to think that Julian Assange thinks that's his business at all. He's not American. He disapproves in very good part of, of what any American administration does. Uh, and the effect of that, I'm speaking strategically now, the effect of that on the development of the law is that if he ever were indicted here and brought here, not only would he have a weaker chance of winning some very hard and close legal issues, but, but he could bring down uh, on the rest of, of the American press, the real press, uh, some very, very bad law. Uh, he already, in my view, is responsible for us not having a federal shield law. Congress was very close to passing a shield law. The votes were just about there when the first big, big trove of materials was released. Uh, I mean, I, 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 look, I don't think you can do, in, what I'm doing in part, you know, blaming him for using his First Amendment rights, but I, I, I do think it's appropriate, if one view, has my views, to condemn him, to censure him for some of the material that he's made public. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, so I thought your point about how conservatives have embraced the First Amendment is very important and very profound. But it's to one of the those areas uh, that I want to address my remarks because I don't agree with it. You and I probably aren't going to agree on this. And that is in the area of what's known as commercial speech. That is the idea that uh, words proposing a commercial transaction are just as precious and just as protected as political or artistic speech. Uh, I do not agree with this. Um, I believe that the regulation of advertising should be treated as just another form of business regulation. So just say talking about cigarettes is one of many examples. It's perfectly okay for the government to regulate um, who can sell cigarettes, who can buy them, where they can be smoked, how they can be labeled, how they can be formulated. That's all business regulation and it's always going to be upheld as long as it satisfies a rational basis test. But when we come to words, it, it, um, that cigarette companies put out to advertise their products, oh my goodness, that can't be touched. That's precious, that's like political or artistic speech. Uh, and that's what conservatives say, and I don't agree with it, and I wonder about your comment. First, I have done some cases in that area, including one, more than one for a cigarette company. Uh, I speak for myself now. No, I don't think that it's just the same as political speech. Um, but I do think that the Supreme Court is correct in a number of its commercial speech cases, at least, in saying that the government should not be in the position of depriving people of information which they may consider just as important uh, as what we might consider is more important. I mean, the old cases 
I, I don't know what your view is on them, but the first cases, dr drug prices, uh, is, is, is where this all started. The first cases were there were bans on, there was an effort to avoid price wars between drugstores and other sellers of uh, d uh, legal drugs. Um, and so uh, states passed laws saying no prices in the window uh, of drugstores. Uh, that was held unconstitutional in an opinion of the court saying that to most people the price of drugs is more important than who they vote for for president um, and, and uh, that it is uh, a step in the wrong direction, an example of a governmental paternalism which was unacceptable to say that that, that material couldn't be made public. And that's been expanded, uh, uh, the amount of liquor, uh, the, the amount of alcohol in beer. Uh, some states have had laws to avoid beer wars or alcohol wars where people would demand more alcohol rather than less. And courts have held that to be uh, unconstitutional. The hard cases, I think, are the ones that, that, that y y you referred to, which are coming up more and more now, which are in the, in the nature of what used to be considered pure economic regulation and, and are now slipping over into the First Amendment side in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of analysis, but always based on the notion against this, uh, the words are always there, of avoiding paternalism. I, I think these are close cases. Uh, but all of the other regulation is paternalistic, right? Yeah, but you have to be a certain easy. age to buy cigarettes. You can't, they have to be formulated in a certain way. All those regulations involving drugs or alcohol or cigarettes or everything else are paternalistic, right? The government says that certain things can't be done because they're dangerous. Yeah, but none of them are speech. But none of, but oh, when you talk about words, that's yeah. precious. I don't see the difference. Well, One form of paternalism is as objectionable let, let as the other. Let me mention a recent cigarette case, and I was involved in this case. Uh, the, the case arose out of the federal law, which now requires, which will soon require cigarette companies to have on half their pack rather grotesque pictures of people dying from cigarette-related diseases, right? Children crying, person lying down in a body bag, uh, et cetera, which are gonna take up half of uh, cigarette packs. I argued, and others argued with me, that for the government to require the cigarette companies to put on their packs, as opposed to the government doing advertising against smoking, but to require the cigarette companies to put on their packs something which almost screams out, don't buy this product, violated the First Amendment. And I think that that, that is so. I think that, that where you're talking about compelled speech of that sort, you're in a very dicey area. Now, you, you are in an area in which the government is allowed to and does set forth certain things that have to be right now on cigarette packs and they're changing the words uh, uh, as, as time go, goes by, a uh, warning the public. Warning the public to me is different than requiring the cigarette companies to say, don't buy our product. And I think the pictures do that. And the one court that has addressed that so far has agreed with that proposition, and the government uh, has decided not to go to the Supreme Court on that, but to go back to the drawing boards and draft some more pictures. Uh, so in that area, I do think that, that there is a, a, you know, a very serious, a very strong First Amendment argument. Uh, and I do think that paternalism with respect to speech is very different. I mean, if, if in my city, if, if, if our mayor uh, you know, has the votes uh, to, to get through legislation he's now talking about, to raise the age in which people can buy cigarettes. There certainly is no First Amendment uh, argument uh, in, uh, in answer to that. Uh, if he can get through legislation uh, or whatever, uh, he doesn't always 
seek legislation, if, if he is authorized uh, to say that uh, sales can't be made of soda in, in uh, uh, cups that, that are very large, uh, um, I mean, I, I think that's a form of irritating paternalism, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't approach a First Amendment uh, violation. I do think that you know, when you're telling people what to say or not to say, you're, you're getting into a First Amendment area and that there are situations uh, in which uh, even when the speech is commercial, that it, that it ought to be protected. Yes, sir. Um, again, sort of citizens. What about anonymity? Yeah. Now, the Supreme Court has not declared publication of names illegal. They mentioned it in the decision. But they haven't, obviously, through Congress, required it. Do you think, I think you said, I'm sorry, I think you did say it would be all right to have a little bit of information about who was advertising, uh, I who was speaking? More, uh, I, I think it would be constitutional okay. to sorry. have more in the way of disclosure requirements. Um, uh, as I said, the, one of the holdings of Citizens United was that under that statute, uh, you have to make monthly reports, uh, and they're public. I mean, that's why we know. That's why, why I can tell you, because we, we did the math at my office, that in the 2012 Republican primaries, less than 1% of the money spent by all the Republican candidates came from public corporations. And the reason we know that, the reason that we know that is that they have to disclose it. Um, uh, a subject to, to the loophole I mentioned earlier, which is that you know, if they give money to the Chamber of Commerce, that yet so far doesn't have to be disclosed. You may have seen in the paper today uh, a, a uh, proposal uh, put to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, which would require corporations to disclose uh, what political contributions they were making. Um, I think as a general proposition that that is likely constitutional, that that, that is consistent uh, with the First Amendment. Um, there are people who believe, including friends of mine who've worked a long time at the ACLU, uh, that it's not. Uh, I think in, more broadly in the area of, of anonymity, uh, my, my views are that while there are situations such as a great case in the 60s where southern states were trying to force the NAACP to reveal their, their members, where disclosure would do such harm uh, to their civil liberties that anonymity should carry the, 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 the day as it did in that case. But in a more recent case, you know, where, where uh, people signed a petition in effect to put on the ballot Proposition 8 in California, here, sorry, um, uh, I think that if you sign a petition and submit it to the government urging them to put something on the ballot, that you don't have a right of anonymity. Um, and that public, uh, to use the greatest cliche in First Amendment law, public has a right to know. Well, I think we're done. Thank you all very much. Uh, if you'd like, I believe that the books are still on sale and Floyd would be willing to uh, sign some of them. So please join us outside. Thank you. Uh.